it, and it's so crazy how like split types of media have become over, you know, the last uh, few years. I mean, if you think back like the 1950s, you had two channels, you know what I mean? And that's it. And like all the content that you could consume was so, you know, funneled into this one way. And now you have, you know, like YouTube shorts or like TikToks is like, that's a whole new form of digesting content. You have the long form podcast, which, which like, if you had told someone in the fifties, oh yeah, dude, it's a hit to listen to other people sit around and have a conversation. And it's like, but am I a part of the conversation? No, you're not, <laughs> you know, you're just listening to other people talk. Uh, but the way to like digest that information is, is for, you know, it's just amazing. And then you have obviously the video long form video stuff, like how we digest content is so amazing. And then how, how that reflects on other people creating content. So like you had a roadmap to sort of like figure out what to do with this because, you know, it, like the saying is like you, you stand on the, the shoulders of giants, right? So yeah. like you see what other people are doing and then you're like, I can do that better or I, I can do it better in a, in a, you know, a certain industry or, or like I can find a niche. Um, but without seeing people do this, you don't even know that it's possible. And it's like... You know, we'll get into your YouTube stuff uh, in a bit more detail down the road, but like your latest impossible route to French one is an hour and a half. And it reminded me of a conversation I had with a friend last week who's just getting into content creation. And they asked me like, well, what's the ideal length for a piece of content? They hadn't decided on their medium yet. And I was like, well, if it's shit and it's 10 seconds, it's too long. If it's like Avatar and it's awesome and it's four hours, it's probably too short. Like he, I'd watch Avatar for six hours. Totally. And actually we, uh, I've had to go to bat for myself many times on these films. Cause every time I, I submit like the first cut, uh, you know, Canyon, Jeremiah, everyone who's not a content creator is like, you need to cut 30 minutes out of that. And it's like, yeah, but that's, that's destroying the story. You know, you can't, I can't do that. And I don't go into content creation with a time limit. I literally don't like, at one point I was, I was worried about it. I'd actually put like an adjustment layer over the top of the, the timeline to say like, okay, here is the 20 minutes that I, you know, so to kind of give me an idea of like how long I have to go. Anyways, look, if it's a good story, you, it's going to take however long it's going to take to tell that story. Now, very uh, episode one, season one, which is Death Valley, that was an hour and 47 minutes. 32% of people that have watched that have watched the entire duration from start to YouTube cutting the video off, right? Like, like the 32% have watched that entirety of that. Like that's crazy, right? And so then look, I, I love long form. I love telling a really good story. I mean, obviously there's like, we just, like I just said, there's other forms of content. So like I can do Instagram reels if I want to tell a story in one minute, but there is a thing that, okay, this gets kind of hippie, but like, I feel the story like a road. Uh, I can feel how the story ramps and descends. I can feel it winding and curving. It's so strange, but it's, it's like, I'm holding onto a rock. And when I start the project, it's very rough. And it's just like this, it's not pleasing to hold on to. Uh, and then over time, I like rub these little like edges off of it. And I start to smooth it out. And I, I can just keep feeling this rock with my mind, which is so strange, but I can feel these little rivets and bumps. And I'm like, ah, I don't like the way this feels. And then I just hours and hours and hours go by and you've just perfected one minute of an hour and 40 minute, you know, video. Um, I, I think why YouTube and podcasts are quite different. I, you talked about Lex Freeman before, and I love the awkward pauses on podcasts that you don't really get away with in YouTube. There's an interview between Lex Freeman and Elon and Lex asks a question. And I think the pause is something like 27 seconds of just total silence. And Lex doesn't like contextualize the question, doesn't clarify the question, justify the question. He just sits quietly. That sort of stuff is slightly different, but I'm so jealous of YouTube because it's 
you obviously have the benefit of editing, but because of that, you have this beautiful story arc. Like when I think about captivating movies, they all follow quite nice principle of there's a hero. There, the hero leaves the comfort of wherever he is. If we think of Frodo, he has to leave the Shire to go on this journey. And then the hero goes on two journeys. He goes on the journey to, to ride the route, this impossible route, and get to the start to the finish. That's the external journey, but the more interesting journey is actually the internal journey. Who does Tyler become in the process of completing this route? That's the really interesting one, and I think you capture that so well in your videos. Well, here's what's so wild is that there's a whole algorithm and, and formula to designing a story. Um, I've read a couple books about like story creation techniques. Um, and when you actually break it down, it's so formulaic and actually ruins how you watch other videos. Cause you're <laughs> like, you know, if you watch a movie with these, these concepts in your head, you're like, oh, okay, this is that formula. And now I know exactly what is going to happen. Um, and it will just fit in perfectly like, like, you know, Tetris blocks, but I don't, before I knew any of that, I still had this ability to create a story that almost lined up exactly with what the like, you know, premium Hollywood blockbuster formula is, which like feels good that without even knowing that I just have this like instinct on how to tell a story. Um, and, and a lot of that comes from the fact that I like remove myself from like the editor is one person, me as a human is another, and then me on the screen is a character. So there's like this, it's really strange. Like I, I'll edit without like my personal input on me. You know what I mean? So I'm not trying to like make myself look good. I'm not like, oh, well, I don't want to put me like looking stupid like this. You know, as the editor, I'm like, oh, this is a great character moment. Like, oh, this idiot's crying on the top of a mountaintop. Oh, let's put this in. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it, that it's me. Uh, and so, you know, that's another thing is like good content creation is the ability to separate yourself, you know, and just tell the story as it is and not try to like manipulate it. Um, that's the other thing I think sometimes people get into trouble is they try so hard to like force a story uh, or they'll go into it and they're like, this is the story I want to tell. But if that's not the story that happened, you know, and then it's, it's really risky because we don't script this. Uh, and so what if nothing happens, you know, like, okay, the France film that cost us almost 50 grand to do. So what if, what if we go and the route is too easy or we don't even come close to finishing it or our bike breaks in half or like there's so many things that could go wrong. And so then it's like, this is kind of, it's just kind of gnarly. This is scary. Uh, but you know, we, we do what it is. Then we, I get into the edit room and I'm like, okay, what story do I tell? Because there's a couple different angles you can, you can take. Um, but, I always just look for emotion. Uh, there's something that my mom has said to me a few times. She said, you know, people will not remember what you say or what you do. They'll remember how you made them feel. And like so like you regardless. Okay. Like if you look back in your memories, there a lot of times you're like, I don't remember exactly what this person said, but it's stuck in your mind because they gave you a feeling. And that feeling lasts much longer than like what the actual verbiage was. Let's circle all the way back to the, the very beginning, the idea for the vegan cyclist. Do you regret the name? Did you anticipate the brand taking off as big as it has and are now kind of stuck to a name that you don't love? Or is it still something you're quite proud of? No, yeah, I, do that. I really regret the name uh, a ton. Uh, I have, got, I probably think about changing that brand name twice a week, but <laughs> it, it's like, it's, it's so difficult because if you look at it as a business side, when I look at my analytics, the top out of my top five ways people find me, the top four are some version of vegan cyclist, the vegan cyclist, vegan cyclist, cycling, vegan, uh, and then impossible route. Right. Like those are my top five. So 
if I change that, what what is the, you know, I, I'm going to take a, sh a short term hit with the idea that I will then grow long term because my name won't won't hinder people. Um, but then again, it's my life. Like, I mean, being plant based is a huge part of my life. It's something that that I don't struggle with uh, at all. It's not like, oh, well, I don't want to be this anymore. And I want to, I want to go back to eating bacon cheeseburgers. Like being plant-based is, is always going to be some component of my life. Now I don't like put a cage on anything. I don't ever, like, I'm, I don't want to be religious about the whole thing. Like to me, you, you know, you got to be open to change at all points. Like regardless of how I feel about it at this moment, when I'm 60, you know, I don't know, maybe I, maybe I want to eat free range chickens or something. I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do in the future. But as of right now, like this is such a huge part of my life. And also, um, it starts a conversation about diet and lifestyle that I think is really beneficial to a lot of people because I'm not an activist about it. Like I don't open up and go, you're a bad person. You need to do this. Like, I don't even say the word vegan. I just, ever. Like I don't ever really talk about it at all. Uh, and, and so then when people are met with an expectation of this guy's going to yell at me about food, then I don't, then they're like, well, wait, I was expecting this guy to be super annoying about food and diet. And he wasn't. Uh, and then he also did these crazy things. Like he won a national championship. Then they start to, <laughs> then they start to go, well, wait a minute. So he can perform. He's not annoying. Um, and, and he's plant-based like that, that just dissolves that sort of immediate, like idea of what, what being vegan is. And yeah, so I then he's kind of revolted by the community. Like I was in like a couple of forums and just seeing some stuff and people, dude, like people would come onto a vegan forum and be like, I'm so close. Like all I'm eating is fish now. Like I feel so good. And they're like, you're still killing animals. Like, how dare you think you're good? And it's like, bro, what the shit is this? Like, everyone's at a different point in their journey. Why is everyone so black and white here? Uh, it, it, anyways. And so then very early on, I had an opportunity to change my channel name. And I didn't uh, because I was getting no views. Like, in the first year, I got 1,000 subscribers and maybe like 1,200 views, right? Like, I mean, it was just not like not going anywhere. So then it wasn't really till year three that like things kind of picked up and no one really knew me or like anything was going on. And so by the time the channel blew up, the brand was like pretty like locked in. Now, plant-based lifestyle is like a huge part of my life. It's not my identity. It's not what I would lead with. Like I would never go to a party and introduce myself. Hi, I'm, I'm a vegan. You know, like that's not, what I want to lead with. Like, I feel like I'm a guy who does, I'm a filmmaker that does crazy adventures um, and then manages a family. Yeah, like, I raced for a year as a vegan. And for much the same reasons, it sounds like you found it. I went down that rabbit hole of trying to get extra performance out. And I researched a lot of stuff about the anti-inflammatory properties of vegetarian diet. And I took that one step further to vegan. So I raced in the US in 2013, 2014, around then, uh, at a Conti team, Estellas, and I raced fully vegan that year, which meant eating quite a lot of Chipotle. But it was wild because I wasn't an ethical vegan. I wasn't objecting to animal welfare. Like, I'm sure if I dug into it, I'd object to it, but I was just oblivious to it. It was mainly for performance. So I would go to a friend's barbecue, like I'm talking once a year, twice a year, and I'd have like a couple of chicken wings. And I'd have friends who were vegan. It'd be just like, oh, you're the problem. It's like, what? Like, hold on. Like, it doesn't have to be that binary. Like, why can't you just do like a lot of, like make a lot of good choices, but then make a choice sometimes that, you know, isn't totally. as a lot. T to totally. Like 90% health. Like that's sort of where I fall into, right? Like if, if I live my life 90% healthy, like that other 10%, it's, just, it's marginal. It's not, it's, that's not what like is the problem in my eyes. And obviously everything in moderation, including moderation itself, but like 
I don't know. I think that a lot of people are going away from that word vegan and more towards plant based um, because it's, you know, it's, it's a little more open ended. And would I um, eat animals at this point in my life? Like, no, unless I hunted it or killed it myself. Like that's, that's sort of the out that I give myself is like, if I want to eat venison, then I'll get my wife's, my wife's dad, my father-in-law will strap on some recurve bows and go hunting for a few days. And if I, if I collect myself a buck, then, and I process it and I hike it out and I do the whole thing. And I have that intimate relationship with taking a life of another animal, then like, okay, but that amount of work for what I, for having meat is just at this point, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I would, it's just that I would go through that experience. And I think that for most people, if they just reduced their meat intake to like a reasonable amount, because everyone's like, oh, well, you know, when we were hunter gatherers, we were primarily carnivores. And we only ate meat. So if you think that this is healthy, like that's not how we evolved. And it's like, yeah, but dude, we evolved with a faster femen, right? Like f faster famine. Like we would eat nothing but sticks and berries and then go run a marathon to track down your animal. You know what I mean? And so then you had to feast everything and then you would eat, you know, nose to tail. You would eat everything, but that's not how it is anymore. Like people just eat this highly anyways. It's not really a part of like um, what I want to lead with as a brand. And, and, and I've thought a lot about like where I'm going to take this in the future. Um, and so I've started two other companies to, to springboard off of the Vegan Cyclist channel. One is the Impossible Route. And even though it is on my channel currently, the main goal is to, to take Impossible Route onto its own channel, on its own thing, like its own brand that goes beyond me. That like... We will have episodes with people, not me or not Jeremiah, and I'll have a film crew and maybe even an edit crew. Like we can, we can do something with that. I I also started a clothing company that wasn't vegan related, right? Like it's just ride bikes. It's and not that like has to be, hemp. No, it's just. I, I mean, our clothing is like top quality stuff, but like it's it it's just for everyone, right? It's not elitist. It's moto mountain bike unicycle it don't matter if you ride bikes in any fashion like then this clothing this casual clothing line is for you so like our prices are low our quality is high and the designs are are cool like they're just chill like it's not super elitist so um, how did you, you know, how, how did you meet jeremiah i've had him on the podcast and he's just such a nice conversationalist he's a he's a storyteller he's a funny guy and he's a kick-ass bike rider what was your first interaction with him um yeah so it, the first interaction was uh in vermont it was actually kind of a crazy and now that you like if you look back on it it's actually totally nuts how it all worked out but so um cliff bar was sponsoring this uh this gravel race in vermont and so they brought me out to make content. So if Cliff Bar is sponsoring this event, they want more eyeballs on, on you know, their brand. So they bring me out. They also connect with Specialized. And so at this point, I have no dealings with Canyon really at all. And uh, there was supposed to be two Specialized waiting at this event for me and, and the, the other guy that I brought. They had sent those Specialized bikes to the wrong state. So then we show, we show up the day before this race. Um, and, and I mean, it was like a, it's like a huge travel thing to get here and we have no bikes and there's no way we're going to get them like zero chance. And so then, uh, I just saw, you know, this Canyon van with like demo bikes in the parking lot. And so then I ran over there and I was like, Hey, uh, I don't have a bike to, to, to race. Uh, and it was Jeremiah who was like unpacking the bikes and he was like the rep. I had no idea who he was. I'm not like, I'm, I'm not really a fan of the sport, to be honest. Like I love riding bikes, but I don't know anyone in the sport. Like I'm a moto fan. Like I love motocross, supercross. I, I don't know anything about cycling. So like, I just saw him as a guy. And so then we chatted, we got the bike, you know, cool. I did a video of it. And then in the video, people were like, I can't believe 
you didn't know who that was. Like, how dare you? Like, he's a legend. Like, you know, Jesus, like, can you be more ignorant? And I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, I had no idea. So then I, I Google him. And so then I reached out to him. I was like, hey, man, I don't know if I came off like disrespectful. Uh, like, I didn't know who you were or anything like that. Um, so I, whatever. But he was, that's what's so cool about Jeremiah is that he's a two-time national champion. He's a legend in the sport. And he comes off as a, a guy, right? Like he doesn't have this aura where he's like something super special that you have to treat him differently. And so, so then uh, we kind of just started chatting a little bit. And then he invited me out to his Fondo, um, you know, to do some content. And we got to kind of hang for like three days in his hometown. Um, and that was really cool. So then he had this whole project to take, take on the world's hardest Strava segment, which is uh, in Mauna Kea or up Mauna Kea volcano, but all road, right? Like it's, it, thousands of people have done this. So he was going to try to go for the KOM on that hard segment. Uh, and so then he was like, you want to come out and film it? And I was like, well, no, I don't want to just film it, dude. I, like I'm going to ride it. Like I want to be a part of it. Like if I'm going to do something. And so then this was his project his everything like i there was no budget you know what i mean like i flew my family out on my own dime um this whole deal and so then and he was on vacation with his family in hawaii so like it just all kind of happened organically uh but then right before we got there uh this guy from big island tours cycling tours he was like well there's this other route that no one's ever done before and it starts in waiopia valley um and it goes up this gravel road and like, in theory, it's possible, but no one's ever done it before. So then it was like, whoa, like that sounds way cooler than doing something thousands of people have done. Uh, but at this point, dude, like I have no business doing this. Like I'm not a gravel rider. We, I, I, I got a bike the day before. So I'm setting up this bike in a parking lot um, 12 hours before we head off onto the first impossible route. <laughs> and so then, you know, it was just wild. It was just such a wild situation. And I, and I wanted to be so good and like not let anyone down because I got, whoever's got to edit this. I'm so sorry. Uh, sorry about that call. Don't worry. It's not me. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, so I'm in a warehouse for the, it, anyways. Okay. I'll jump back into the, the story. So. Okay, so then we start this crazy, and I have no idea how long this is going to be or what is in store. Uh, and it's really funny because we've got the, the guide with us is also like a, a pro cyclist, like he raced, you know. Uh, so um, I've and I've never been up at elevation before. So, so just like every possible thing that could be not on my side. Also. Um, I was dealing with some major knee issues. Uh, and so like my knee was like barely working, but it didn't matter. You know, here's the thing is that you don't know what you, um, you don't know what opportunities in your life are going to fork your life. And so I sort of have this just base principle of just like, let's just say yes to everything and see what happens. Because what, what happens if you say no to something and then your life never takes off? 